If you haven't done so yet, make sure that you pause the video and try to answer the question on your own first before listening on. What we're going to do first in the section of the circuit that's marked AC, this segment right here, is draw a current that's flowing through that segment. And we can draw that current in any direction that we choose, so we'll just arbitrarily make the current go this way. And we can go ahead and label that current I1. And in a similar manner for this segment of the circuit marked CE, we can draw a current that's flowing in this direction, and we can label that current I2. Now, let's go back to current I1. When it reaches the junction that's marked A, some of the current is going to flow to the right, and the rest of it is going to flow up this segment of the circuit. Let's say that an amount of current that we will just call I is flowing to the right. Well, the junction rule is going to allow us to come up with an expression for the amount of current going this way, because we know that the total current that's going into the junction would equal the total current that's going out of the junction. Now the current that's going into that junction is I1, and the current that's going out would be the current that we marked I plus this current which we haven't marked yet. We'll just call it X for now. Now we could solve this little equation for X by subtracting I from both sides, and we would see that I1 minus I would equal X. So we're going to go ahead and label this current right here using the label I1 minus I rather than X. Now if we come over here to junction E, we could see that the current that we have marked I is entering that junction, and the current that we marked I2 is also entering that junction, going back to the junction rule which tells us that the total current in is equal to the total current out of the junction, then the current in, as we just said, is I plus I2, and that's going to equal the amount of current that's exiting the junction. Therefore, the amount of current that's coming out right here would be I plus I2, or I2 plus I if we prefer. So we'll go ahead and label that current that's coming out of the junction. We will next apply the loop rule to the loop that begins at point A, moves upward to point B, makes a right-hand turn to point C, and then returns back to point A, basically this right triangle right here. Let's begin that journey at a spot that we can mark X, and we're going to move around that loop until we return back to this X. Now, when we move across a battery going from a negative to a positive plate, what we have is a positive potential change. And so we can mark a positive potential change as we move across that battery. We then come across this resistor that's marked R. Now if we look carefully, we can see that the current down here that we labeled I sub 1 minus I comes up through this segment and then turns and flows through this resistor right there. So we could say that the current that's flowing through that resistor is I1 minus I. Now Ohm's law tells us that a potential difference across a resistor is equal to its resistance multiplied by the amount of current. The resistance right now is marked R, and the current is as we just stated. So we could say that the potential change across that resistor would be the resistance R multiplied by the current, I1 minus I. Furthermore, since we are moving through our loop in the direction of the current, as indicated by the purple arrow, we're going to have a negative potential change. Anytime you're moving through a loop with the direction of the current, you have a negative potential change. So over here, we're going to write in that negative potential change, which once again is R multiplied by I1 minus I. We continue through the loop, and then we pass through the resistor that is marked for R. Once again, we could use Ohm's law to determine the potential difference. We would take the resistance, which is for R, and multiply it by the current that's flowing through that resistor. Now that current has been marked as I1. And therefore we have this potential change. Also we are moving with that current, so that would be another negative potential change. So we would come over here and write minus 4R multiplied by I1 to represent that potential change. We then reach point A and turn back upwards to where we had started. That completes the journey through our loop, and whenever we complete that journey, we set all those potential changes equal to zero. Now what we will do next is try to solve this equation for I1. And to do that, we're going to want to distribute this negative R. So that's going to become 
E minus RI1. And then notice you're distributing a negative to a negative, so that's going to become plus R times I. And then we have the minus 4RI1, still equal to 0. Let's go ahead and add the RI1 and the 4RI1 to both sides of the equation. That's going to cancel them out on this side, leaving just E plus RI. And then on the other side, the right-hand side of the equation, we have 4RI1 plus 1RI1. That's going to make 5RI1. And then finally, we can divide both sides of the equation by 5R so that the 5R cancels out on the right-hand side. We will hang on to this equation and use it shortly. We will next apply a loop rule to the loop marked CEDC. So we'll start at point C and we'll go around the loop and return to point C. We'll put a little X here to mark a starting point. We move through the loop, we encounter a resistor, and we're flowing with the current, so that's going to be a negative potential change. And that negative potential change will equal the resistance multiplied by the current. Now that current has been marked I2. We then continue through the loop and we turn upward. We cross this battery. Now we're going from a negative to a positive plate. That is a positive potential change equal to 2 times E. So we have plus 2E. Finally, we make a left-hand turn up here, and we are flowing, or moving, I should say, in this direction. Now notice that is the same direction as this current right here. If you follow that current up the loop here, and it makes a turn right there, we would be flowing with that current. That's a negative potential change, and that potential change would be the resistance of 2R multiplied by that current of I2 plus I. And then we return to where we had started, so we set this equal to 0. We'll go ahead and try to solve this equation for I2. So let's go ahead and distribute this negative 2R to both terms in the parentheses. We can then go ahead and add the 3RI2 and the 2RI2 to both sides of the equation. On the right-hand side, therefore, we will have 5RI2. And then we'll divide both sides of this equation by 5R, and that way we can isolate the I2. We will hold on to this result as well. One more loop rule here. This time we will be looking at loop C, A, E, C. So we're going to start right here. We're going to move to point A, then to point E, and then back to where we started. We're moving with the current through this resistor right here. That's a negative potential change equal to the resistance of 4R multiplied by the current I1. We move along through our loop, and then we come to this resistor. Now notice here we're moving against the current that's marked I2. This is the first time we've seen that. Since we're moving against the current, we'll have a positive potential change, and that will be the resistance of 3R multiplied by the current I2. We then return to point C, and then to our starting point, and therefore we can set this equal to zero. If we then add this term to both sides of the equation, then we can just do a little bit of rearranging. That'll cancel right there. And that leaves us with this equation. Now, if you look carefully at the two equations that we boxed in, we had solved them for I1 and for I2. Notice that I1 and I2 appear in this orange colored equation as well. So we're going to carefully take the expression for I1, which is this expression right here, and we're going to substitute it in right there. Also, we'll take the expression for I2 and substitute it in right there. So we went ahead and made that substitution. And keep in mind that the question wanted us to find the current between points A and E. If we look back at the diagram, which we've sort of shrunk down, the current that was flowing from point A all the way over to point E was the current that we had marked I. So we're trying to solve this rather complex equation for the variable I. But we can simplify it a little bit if we look carefully. So we can see that this R and this R appear on both sides of the equation. What that means is if we divided both sides of the equation by R, those R's would actually cancel out. In a similar manner, if we multiply both sides of the equation by 5R, then we would see that the 5R in the denominator on each side would also cancel out. Next, we'll go ahead and distribute the constants into the parentheses on both sides of the equation. We could then add this 6RI to both sides. That's going to create a 10RI on the right-hand side. We can then subtract 4E from both sides. That gives us 2E on the left. And then finally, we can divide both sides by 10R. And that allows us to solve for the current I. 
And this is important because that's what the question's asking for. We can go ahead and substitute in 250 volts for E. And then for the resistance R, it's given in kilo ohms. Let's be careful, one kilo ohm is a thousand ohms. That would be the standard unit. So we'll go ahead and plug in the known values. And if you work that out, you should get roughly 0 0.05 amps is equal to the current. And if you needed to express it in milliamps, what you could do is multiply it by a thousand. And so if you multiply this by a thousand, you're going to move the decimal point over three places to the right. You end up with about 50 or exactly 50 milliamps. So that's an equivalent answer as well.